All right, greetings. Thank you, George and Randall. So it's Education 26. And we'll see who joins in. Um, We can see what post Shingai has recently made. Self-modeling from two days ago. Interesting topic. Um, Or look at, just start with whichever of you would like to bring something in first. Uh, since you brought that up, um, I haven't looked at the part specifically about um, uh, Bitcoin, or it wasn't Bitcoin, it was Ethereum, I think. Uh, Self-modeling, I, I skimmed through it and got a sense of what it is. But um, <clears throat> something I've been looking for, and I know I ran across it when I was working on my PhD. It's a theorem that I think, if I recall correctly, it proved that any problem and, and think of you know what, what we do when we solve problems is we model the situation. We build a model, whether it's a mathematical model or, or a uh, system dynamic model or whatever the case might be, that that could be represented in a graph. Um, so just with nodes and, and uh, labeled nodes and, and uh, links, you could you could build anything. And the reason I'm I'm desperate to find that <clears throat> is because I want to offer that as evidence for why the brain is structured the way it is, why neur neural networks actually work uh, the way they do in building these models. Um, <clears throat> you ever heard of that? I don't know it specifically. Is it so? It it, it is um, supporting the claim that any model can be represented graphically, right? I mean, it sounds almost equivalent to saying that graph is a general data object or format. Because you could have the trivial graph, which is just a set of nodes, or you could have arbitrarily associative nodes and edges. And so anything that you can describe in a um, natural or formal syntax can be graphically described. So I mean, what can't be described with a graph? And then so yeah, it's, it's, models that solve problems are just one subset or one genre of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I went through my uh, old graduate level algorithms books for and looking at the graph theoretic stuff, and I couldn't find <clears throat> I couldn't find it, but I, I could swear that um, I ran across it somewhere along the line. Um, it was it was it was basically saying that any problem that could be expressed, any computable problem that could be expressed in, you know, whatever form, algorithmically or whatever, could be represented in a graph. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, uh, augmented graph where you label label things. Now, I, I've implicitly been using that in all the work I do because everything I represent is as is a graph, uh, maybe a flow graph, but it's nevertheless the. Um, and I know uh, George, people like George Clear and other people have often reduced system definitions to graph theoretic. But but I I want to make a case for the fact that that's why our brains work so well, is that we literally can take anything that we run into any pattern that we run into, uh, spatio-temporal pattern can be uh, encoded in a graph. And that's what brains do is create graphs. It reminds me of um, some work on um, what's called mental time travel. And uh, this guy 
uh, Tom Suddendorf has written about this. He talks about mental qualities that separate humans from other animals. Um, I don't know if it has anything, you know, sort of neurologically to do with the particular capability, but, um, you know, there's, it, it seems to me to relate back to, you know, what you find in um, the interesting, one of the interesting things about, um, uh, say, uh, RNNs, uh, neural networks, um, is that they can recurse back on themselves, right? Um, and there's, that's kind of like, it just seems analogous to this idea of mental time travel. You can sort of hold two things in your mind at one time. And that sort of resonates with the concept of a graph. Yeah, and nice. Thank you. Representing it visually. Yeah. Just a few pieces that 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 reminds me of. This is a, a live stream from uh, earlier in the week with with uh, on neuromorphic computing. So it's interesting. They distinguish neuromorphic algorithms, which can then be implemented on von non Neumann architecture, but are you know biologically inspired or something, and then also eventually tending into the neuromorphic hardware uh, materials, and then the kind of like principle is leveraging some feature of the material system and then using that as kind of like a strength not a weakness like using spatial proximity using leakiness or stochasticity of small subunits so it's like if you can leverage what is happening real time for free everywhere then that brings these like statistical properties so the presenter david modeled like synaptic variability uh, under the free energy principle in terms of updating. So that was one very interesting uh, piece. So then like the brain, you know, leverages its sparsity regionally and more microhistologically to be able to embody many patterns, but saying all patterns is, is, um, It's not, it's, not, it's not what all patterns are, but the brain can always represent something, but that doesn't mean it's going to be adequate. And then, um, then, inter then here's one other work where it was like spiking neural networks can use less energy than traditional neural networks because instead of like needing to bring a float every time, okay, this one has a 1% chance of firing. The weight is 0.01. So instead of that 0.01 every single time step, you just send one spike every 100 time steps and you don't need to send any information otherwise. So like that could be like a camera sensor that only triggers spikes when there's movement. So that's like kind of cool. Like if there's something that only reactively responds, then it can use less energy. And graphs describe these. It reminds me of Shinkai's um, blog or something where it's like, what isn't a system? Yeah. But it's like, what what can't be mapped with a graph or what? Yeah, I'm a um, <clears throat> former boss, the dean of the school here. Um, his son is uh, currently working on his PhD and he's working on spiking uh, neural networks. And <clears throat> What's funny to me is I go way back to my PhD work and that's exactly what I did. I represented a train of spikes. Uh, I did both. I did uh, time averaged and, and um, real time spiking. And um, <clears throat> even, well, I got, a, I got a patent on the concept, um, which is long since gone away because I, I didn't pursue it economically um yeah what goes around comes around yeah yeah I, I, um yeah like 
And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll copy him what we were just discussing before we started with the Gerald Edelman, um, working with Gerald Edelman. Like he, uh, they, they talked about how he emphasized what now we would call the neurodevelopmental approach and all these different features. And it's, <laughs> but the times do change. Computation hardware changes a lot. Um, okay. Randall, any topic you want to go to? Well, I was just going to maybe remark is that um, one of the aspects of, you know, of cognitive systems as they have evolved is that there's this, um, you know, pressure, uh, you know, if you, you know, competitive pressure to improve somehow in say temporal prediction. So I would speculate that in evolutionary terms that um, that capacity as it developed in human beings provided some competitive advantage. Um, And it's, it's just sort of curious that, you know, we're at an, an inflection point now with technology um, where we may have sort of exceeded ourselves, <laughs> right? How it's, exceeded? Um, how, ex exceeded? Um, how? How? Uh, well, by use, you know, by being able to um take advantage of this um temporal prediction uh capability we're able to create tools um and and envision their operation um you know in our minds without actually having to you know perform do perform something um and that has evolved into the creation of these computational systems. You know, uh, which now are, you know, operate on a scale that's that it ex can can exceed the capacity of or the resolution of or, or the temporal <laughs> resolution of, you know. Our perceptual systems. Yeah. Very good point. The development of um, uh, of uh, increasingly animate, knowledgeable, agentic, sophisticated cognitive tools, which are tool like in that they're projected by human toolmakers, but a knife or shelter is only trivially cognitive and now we have cognitive systems that can do large amounts of um, computation in between you know the time it takes a blink right so they're faster so it's it's a faster ooda loop just fa it, it, it's interleaving within our pace of sense making which actually comes back to necessitate mental time travel and different kinds of um, temporal awareness when dealing mm -hmm. with co computer systems. Right. Multiple, multiple senses of time awareness. Like how much time is it going to take to make it? Like engineering time, how much run time and then more like abstract time concepts like um, run time requirement, like just computational complexity talking about like the time of it scaling in principle against some idealized other variable, but that's not clock time. And then also in um, distributed or federated systems, different time concepts, because each agent or worker is going to have a different clock. So just knowing up oh, it's 2.30 doesn't really convey what that situation's about either. Mm-hmm. 
Right, right. And all of this, you know, in a sort of fascinating way is happening in, in our imaginations, which are both situated in time, <laughs> right, in real time, but, you know, projecting into uh, maybe a, what you might call be a synthetic time. Or an imaginary time. Yeah. Um, when you said the time, like deep, uh, temporal active inference, is is when there's the ability to basically have memory and anticipation. It just it's just deep temporal. This is the one time step. Let me just find the image with with a deeper one. Three time scales. Three three transition probabilities. You know mm -hmm. how do how do things change on the hour to hour, the minute to minute, the second to second, nested um, change in time scale. How, how how does anyone think this relates to systems or some other area of like just any education or? Well, it relates directly to uh, hierarchical control theory, where <clears throat> the lowest level uh, regulator is operating in real time, and then uh, you take time averaged data of its performance passed up to the coordinator. Uh, which is operating over a longer time scale. And then uh, that <clears throat> uh, performance data from that is uh, that, well, then you have to separate coordinators into tactical and logistical coordinators. <clears throat> but eventually that goes up to the longest time scale time horizon of the uh, strategic regulator, which is looking both outside the system and inside the system, getting all of the correlated data from what's going on in these multiple time scales, and then making some decisions about what uh, what the whole system ought to do if, if it's an evolvable system. So in terms of our, our brains, we are evolvable in the sense that we can construct a new um, neural networks representing things that we that we learn the, the stuff that's out there that we're gaining knowledge of <clears throat> pardon me and so we are strategic systems having that that uh, and we talk about this all the time is it well do I want to go to college who do I want to marry how do I you know, these are long time scale kinds of decisions um, and so the, you have to collect all that data. And I think that diagram you just showed us is a, is a reasonable representation of a hierarchical, uh, based on time, um, system, or it could be used in a regulator system. It might be interesting to consider, um, these artificial systems in a Darwinian context, you know, with uh, the pressures of human human needs and requirements and so on. What do you mean? Um, um, I mean, we were just talking about Gerald Edelman. Uh, do you mean um, neural Darwinism? Maybe artificial neural Dar Darwinism. Uh, well, I was going to say, I think, um, Daniel, you may know, but I believe I recall that Edelman and somebody else actually um, uh, did some simulations. Yeah, so they had an artificial system that demonstrated a capacity to uh, implement neural Darwinism. Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah, okay. um, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure which one you're referencing, but but for a general enough understanding of neural Darwinism, which is to say that like, um, if there's some 
mind or computational space that's differentially retaining differentially retaining something differentially retaining solutions to a problem or or differentially retaining learnt parameters those th that differential persistence in the informational space can be described with a darwinian framework because yeah. that it, it's going to be like saying retention of the most retained variable or of the most retained or ex exhibited neural pattern is equivalent to saying like there are more birds of this kind than that kind um but but like when you started talking about this randall you said like there's like a when you said the competitive pressure i kind of broke that out into like there's that like internal competition winnerless competition or fame in the brain is like there's some paper about it it's like you know not every idea can be equally famous in the brain if you have a flat attention distribution nothing would be being considered and then if you had the the other extreme limit is just a spiked attention distribution on one concept so a fame in the brain or neural darwinism but then also you have um you know this evolutionary so you, then you could even say okay i installed four language models locally on my computer and uh one of them didn't work at all so i deleted it and then the ones that did work you know i use them this way and this way so it's that that could also be understood as like selection right right yeah that's that's more what i'm i'm referring to is that there's there's an active selection going on um and you know, not that it's necessarily predictable, but there may be some interesting patterns going on well, there. I think um, one way to view uncertainties or, or anxieties would be like in the domestication of livestock or kale, you know, brassica domestication space. It was like, as soon as we start withholding the nitrogen, it, this cultivar is going to die um or we just let the seeds you know it just you know, it's going to dissipate in like one to three years if we just stop giving it the resource but there is but so, so then that's why you get the livestock is getting selected to be amenable to that niche that cultivation so if we were looking at the evolutionary dynamics of programming languages or of like operating systems which people have done like sfi i've seen work on you know diversification and changes in usage of uh, programming languages because we're providing the energy to run the operating systems. So when we withhold that, that so so that's sort of like, it, it's like livestock. But then the question is like, are we, um, you know, before, during, or after a time when a synthetic intelligent system could, you know, embed itself in a smart contract and accrue energy to buy resources and that's the kind of Rosen's ecology systemic closure. And so if it could become autocatalytic with the appropriate like arbitrages that need to be made between like information, currency, and energy, then it would be like out of any one person's hands. Whereas operating right. system differential selection is kind of like, well, people could just decide differently the next day and it would be different. Right, right. So, you know, you started off talking about self-modeling and sort of the next step from there is self-construction and perhaps the next step from there is self-domestication. So if you look at certain species like elephants and whales, um, there's some interesting things going on there. Um, for instance, these are species where the females get old enough to go through menopause um, and sort of become grandparents, right? Uh, and that's like another level of hierarchical control within the sort of uh, groups. And somehow that gets internalized in the development of the young. Um, And they're able to self-domesticate. That is, they you know they have enough self-control that um, you know they can really sort of form societies, and you know they're fairly complex. And um, with with 
so you know some in interesting capabilities um, that maybe are repeated or reiterated in human societies uh, that aren't say may um, so evident in say chimpanzee or um, uh, dog canine societies. Yeah, one way that I've uh, like thought about that is just from the ant side, like the dialectic over developmental and evolutionary time um, with how many colony strategies. I mean, you got colonies that live in an acorn, colonies that don't make a nest at all. And then also, I'm, I'll, I'll bring this in, um, Deborah Gordon, my PhD advisor, this uh, book is coming out. Mm -hmm. haven't read it can't say but um should be interesting should be interesting and just like collective behavior and i and uh, then one other kind of piece on this um from chris fields in one of his recent lectures he um advanced a very very provocative position which is that the concept of emergence, whether strong or weak emergence, for, for those who make that distinction, that emergence still reifies a reductionist worldview because it still puts a primacy temporally or ontologically on, I mean, what emerges comes from something that was not what is emerged. And then with, with, with closure and, and autopoiesis and things like that, like, but that is still discussed as emergence, mm -hmm. as if still the story or the co or, or the causal direction that had to be conveyed was that smaller things emerge or into you know these like top down. But um, whereas he contrasted that with scale free, which system science is scale free, and in a scale free or just multi scale setting, that you could say that there is emergence between like, Oh, the nest mate, the colony or the colony in the ecosystem, or you could just say it's a multi-scale system, which doesn't a priori privilege smaller things, giving rise to larger things. Mm -hmm. Like it'd be the difference between saying, well, we have, um, we, you know, we, we change the number of large language models that we're simulating in a space and we find that like there's some non-linear relationship, like they're able to do like a little bit of work. And then like there's like a phase transition. All of a sudden they can do some other task once there's 20 of them. Um, one way to say, would be, oh, it's emergent, emergent performance. Or just say it's a multi-scale intelligence system and changing the composition leads to non-linear changes in outcome. And then that way of, saying it doesn't privilege the lower level not to overbeat this but i thought that was like super interesting because emergence is so commonly used mm -hmm. and yet esoterically props up reductionism me interesting um i what sort of comes to mind in relation to that is um or maybe arguably reductionist thinking about the distinction between artificial and natural systems. You know, we find a lot of organisms um, are somehow, and maybe this is just a product of the way, of the way uh, we're looking at these systems or describing them, they're, 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 we describe them as built from the bottom up um, you know, from atoms to molecules to proteins to uh, protein systems to uh, organ systems to, you know, on and on and on. Uh, and it's there, I think, you know, you look at that in the context of the evolution of life on earth, you know, there are all kinds of non-linearities. Um, it is not like a direct, you know, beautiful, <laughs> pristine uh, binary tree from 
3.8 billion years to you know today there's all kinds of disconnects and loops and uh, whirly gigs and who knows what what kinds of things going on um but that's you know earth as you know the complex you know it's not a it's not a simple system either <laughs> you know it's spiraling through a galaxy and, you know, all kinds of things going on, you know, uh, with gravity and things passing by and, you know, disruptions. And um, so I think that's what you might expect, um, you know, over, over time. And again, you know, we're looking at this through the lens of, uh, mental time travel, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, our perceptual system kind of organizes things and, you know, what we sort of perceive as, or at least culturally often describe as the, the, the linearity of time. Oh, great, great topics. I, I, I really like the, with the linearity of time there. Whereas it's like if you um, emphasize the primacy of Kairos experiential time, like time as the model, as the agent models it, rather than like chronometer, you know, unbiased time, but we know it's not. Then, so if you then the time isn't isn't just not linear or not uniquely. I mean, it's it's however the agent sees it, and then agents that don't see it in an adaptive frame quantum reference frame, they get swept off the table thermodynamically. But as long as mm -hmm. you're existing, whatever time concept enables you to be a good regulator of your environment, requisite diversity and everything, that time concept will propagate. And so a time concept that's like, um, I mean, it, 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 there's so many, it, if, depending on what you know, animal or what system or what, like, could it be adaptive to have a time concept that there's only, you know, th just that this doesn't exist or that doesn't exist or any spatial relationship of time. And one other, just, just as, as we're kind of on, on this area, like synthetic, um, the, um, it, uh, we even used the term earlier, but like if someone said, Oh, they have an artificial personality, like, Oh no, you know, synthetic personality. Oh no. But synthesis synthetic doesn't just mean, you know, phony. And artificial similarly could have the denotation of crafted. There's nothing wrong with artifice. And so like, it's just funny that there's a dialectic between, well, oh, it's, it's natural. It's chemical free. It's like, <laughs> but that's water, but it's chemical free. So it's like natural organic versus well, artificial it, it, synthetic. And it's like that, that black and white is just, just fallacious and exploited. You could say that. You could also say that, you know, from a human organistic perspective, you know, we're pretty deep into a situation, you know, so it's, it's a very situational. Um, and could there be other adaptive co time concepts? I think that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, going back to Darwinian evolution, right? Um, if, you know, if, uh, if a time concept, say alternative time concept evolves within the context of say an artificially intelligent system, if you want to call it that, um, that could be, somehow be more adaptive than the human linear time concept, then humans could be wiped off the table. Well, they could be wiped off the table to that cognitive system. Like, let's just say a cognitive system like edged itself to a, 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 a pause. All this Huxley time must have a stop. Then it could think to itself that it had wiped something else off the table, but we're in a multi-perspectival scenario. So, I mean, what if somebody just had a time concept that, you know, 
all was bad or all used to be good or we're going in a good direction. We're going in a bad direction. All those narratives can coexist. Um, but to bring it to, to William Blake, just to kind of just bring in a little citation, but also show how these things, I think having pre-computational mental traveler, a poem. Mm -hmm. I, I just found it very interesting that he would even call it that. And then another uh, famous quote, of Blake, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. And so it's like, well, so if you make a narrative system or a temporal system, narrative and temporality being basically related, narrative just being temporality plus events, event, events in sequence or events in relation, like brings a whole lot and time representations in our own time representations and then the degrees of freedom and the challenges with with other entities and their different time representations mm -hmm. like to it something that just oscillates you could just say it's time concept is that there's two states or something like that chris fields also talks about the clock like you you need to have like a perspective on a variability to have a clock concept These are a lot of random notes, but these are good. <laughs> They're good mm -hmm. topics, and and um, it's clear systems education research brings us these questions. You know, describes and is described by these questions. Yeah, well, it might be useful um, to maybe map some of those dependencies um you know for for human conceptual systems or cultural conceptual systems say you know that 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 idea of having a perspective on variability um the clock concept depends on that what else depends on that that sort of dependency yeah, what this makes me think about is like um, people used to point at the sun and the moon and you speculate why the quality of their light was different. And then we were able to understand why the qualities of their lights were you know, different in the morning and the evening and all these like kinds of things. People have pointed at cultural differences or just more broadly like cognitive differences among species. Um, but all you can do is really point and look in the natural history but but um and now through cognitive science and system science very closely linked as you know george is bringing up um we can take a more systemic or and or scientific um view on cognitive systems mm -hmm. such that it's even possible to, to go beyond like the historical or the forensic and just say, well, these people think differently about time. And then people today go into like, well, then, then they can or can't, or this should or shouldn't be and make normative statements on top of that observation. Whereas the research direction is go from the observation into underlying causes, not towards second, second order interpretations or, like normative statements. One approach that that we believe will be, um, in just short, in some way, in in the short term, helpful. I'll I'll, I'll add the link, but using um, using pattern languages. So Christopher Alexander et al. developing pattern language approach. Um, in the architectural setting, using a pattern language approach to cognitive phenomena, um, using a technology atlas, we can say, okay, what's a concept? Okay, this person asserts that time phenomenology is a concept. New index card is created. Okay, then you asked a question. What cultural dependencies relate to time dependency? Expert A lists three things, 
three new index cards are created. Expert B lists five things. You know, some overlap and some new index cards are created. So as people bring new entities into play, you just make a new index card. As entities associate um, at the system level, we don't take a position on whether expert A or expert B's assertion was true, but then use whatever mechanism you want, ask, you know, hundred people or, you know, do this. And um, until you feel like you've saturated the, um, the associative accounts of cultural time and just keep on linking that into the, um, into networks of patterns, composable patterns and patterns of cognitive phenomena. Mm -hmm. And then just just kind of grapple with it, but but jump in, grapple, and then when you're sampling from a stationarity, you're not gonna. That doesn't even mean you're close to right, but it'll at least be possible to know like when you're when you've sampled a region of the space, um, and then you can develop different accounts of it that would lead you to develop unique explanations, predictions, say, okay. And then you can use Bayesian model selection on the graphs to, to find um, optimal accounts. Mm -hmm. And that would apply to uh, large language models or other synthetic intelligence systems or humans. You can say overconfidence bias could, could apply to a person. It could apply to a, you know, a squirrel, could it apply to a, a black box? And then you can develop system of interest independent evaluative criteria for overconfidence bias. So it's a scale-free description of overconfidence that can then be assessed situationally. You In keeping the index card layer light, so if people have different definitions or different different language definitions of a given term not getting too hung up on it as long as they're using the same term mm -hmm. yeah building kind of a vocabulary of, of patterns yeah mm -hmm. and then having some open source um like ours and if somebody wants to download our hundred index cards, a thousand index cards, and then have a hundred of their own index cards, that is fine. So some like word natural words or entities that are referred to and just by dip, you know, those those are just patterns that everyone can point to. But then someone could have private pattern if they want it or some other entity or something. But yeah, that's one of the things we've been thinking about it from. And then I, I again to the education question. <laughs> Do slash will our current educational pathways and trajectories support people to live and work effectively in these kinds of settings. Are, 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 are slash were they sufficient for how it was in 2018 or 1978 or something? And then are these systems in place going to respond in in which ways this is like the first fall that um chat gpt is in play right we got davis all the undergrads are back in davis but it's like a year ago that wasn't in play but it's like so what's gonna happen first school year of this that's just like the kind of the time scales that things happen at. So. Right. Right. Um, just talking about education. I'm reminding me of uh, something I ran across recently. I haven't, haven't read it yet, but I'm going to see if I can pull up a reference. 
uh, education in a time between worlds, Zachary Stein. I think it kind of it may be kind of looking at that kind of question or our current educational pathways supporting people to work effectively in the uh, emerging setting. Yeah, there you are. That looks interesting. cool yeah yeah meta crisis i think i've in the i've seen his name in the meta crisis like space or heard him speak mm -hmm. a little bit yeah i mean in our systems education discussion though most of these we we did not um to, to actively continue on, but people always highlight the embodied, lifelong, beyond scientific slash technical, you know, aesthetic, artistic components of systems, different people to different extents. So I think, I mean, to, yeah. George, how do you think? How have you seen the um, embodied systems, art kind of art art therapy, art visualization system people, and then the more like technical analytical systems people coexist over the years? Yeah, this is a very good question. The many of the conferences um, have engaged people who are on the artistic side of things, but very systemic in their conceptualizations, I guess. Um, I'm tr trying to remember his name. He's big in the cybernetics world, the uh, ASC. Oh, golly. He gave, he gave a talk to the IEEE. No, that's not good. He gave a talk to the IEEE, but his his big thing is a oh, oh man. You get to a point where you know memory is not your friend. Um well anyway, let, let me just say that there's always been a sort of a natural uh bonding, bridging, um or that's not even really correct. There are people who are inclined more to the artistic side. I am not. I am very much nuts and bolts um, oriented, but appreciative of the some of these artistic, uh, you know, um, endeavors. But um, it all ultimately all gets back to the brain and the brain's capacity to recognize something we call beauty um, in whatever form it may take, whether it's visual or auditory or whatever the case might be. And based on the notion that the brain is a system, there must be something very systemic about the nature of art. And I think that's what a lot of these people are, that's the message that they're trying to convey and, and um, yeah, so it's there's always been a, a you know a combination. There's always been sessions at the conferences that were, were oriented toward many of the art forms. Yeah, wow. and then kind of in closing, <laughs> with the intermodal foundation models we now have, we can take this article and make it into an image and this image and now write an equation about it. And so a lot of the edges that previously would have had to have to happen inside of a person, but it's like, but you're not going to write a symphony about your textbook. All you can do is write your textbook. But, but these kinds of um, transformations and like synesthesias 
are going to be externalized. And then that has many implications for accessibility and for applicability of system science. I think one way to look at it is um, that, you know, different individuals, um, and not to overemphasize uh, this, but different individuals come into the world with sort of a different uh, neurological toolkit. Uh, you know, there's the starting point, um, which, you know, kind of the question is, where does it actually start, you know, um, in or, you know, an individual and what kind of experience is reinforced um, kind of in the, you know, in the growth and development of that individual um, that has resonances, you know, with, you know, preferred experiences, and, you know, that, that come up in life and um, decisions that may be made, um, you know, so it's all kind of, like I was saying, very situational. Um, and, you know, so any given individual is going to have, you know, their own individual preferences and uh, skill sets and that that come to bear on uh, on a situation. Um, Thank you. And it's not that, you know, there's any absolute right or wrong or um, complete body of knowledge that's you know res that resides within an individual it's more sort of the collective sum of all that knowledge and information that we you know I somehow tap into you know when we're in a context like this and able to um, refer to things that you know maybe have some shared um, genesis in our experience and some things that just have no common basis, you know, where we might have areas right. have, have some difficulties translating. Yes. Thank you, fellows. Till yeah. next time. Bye. Take care. Thank you.